Okay, so today, for day two, we have two main topics. We have our AFM, our Advanced Firewall Manager, along with Network Announced Service. That should take us through lunch, because we're starting a little late. You know, might go a little past lunch. Uh, we'll see. And then this afternoon, we'll cover web safe. For AFM, we cover two topics. Try to, I've tried to break this down. I've, I've done the same thing to my SE content and boot camp. Uh, it's very similar now. We just cover really everything about, remember how uh, ASM has two uses, security policies and denial of service. AFM is the same way. It has two uses, policies and denial of service. So we're going to cover policies in lesson one and denial of service in lesson two. So the first slide, why, why do we want to use AFM? Same story we talked about yesterday and the day before when I was talking about APM. Why do we use APM? What's the competitive advantage? Consolidation, data center consolidation. We can put more services on one appliance in the data center. So instead of having 15 appliances and having lots of latency from a hop to hop to hop, we do more things on one device now. This gives us full layer three, layer four security for network firewall services. Very popular in the enterprise space, very popular in the service provider space. GI firewall, a lot of our customers use AFM for that. Very popular. Then we also feel confident using big IP as our network firewall because of the fact that it has so many built-in security elements such as being a default deny device, such as doing SSL termination, and I rules, and many other things. In fact, some of you may know that we, at F5, the uh, Big IP achieved the ICSA certification for a network firewall before AFM was even a product. So we were considered a network firewall before we had a network firewall. If I had time, I would tell you the little story of how that progressed, but um, I don't want to. I don't want to take up your time with that. We also now have uh, they, uh, our developers have done a lot of work in the last two some odd three years, changing our configuration utility so that firewall rules are easier and easier to configure. Now everything on a single screen. Single page, we can view all file. We can view all file. <laughs> we can view all firewall rules on one page and modify and add all firewall rules on one page. I can't talk today. And then uh, we also include an absolute must requirement for enterprise organizations and service provider: the ability to do high-speed logging to all the most common high-speed log sources or destinations like syslog and Splunk. So for all of those reasons, AFM's not a bad choice, but let's think about something else. Um, so my, my customer already has ASM on the big IP, maybe even APM. Anybody know which one of our uh, licensing bundles ASM is in? Best, it's in best, very good. Anybody know what licensing bundle AFM is in? Better. Good, good. You guys do a good job on that. So, if my customer already has best, or let's even say they have better. They have best or they have better. All of this great stuff, how much does it cost them? Nothing. Nothing. They've already got it. They just may not be using it. This is all for free. They don't have to pay for another box, another big IP. They don't have to pay for another firewall. They don't have to pay for another license. It's all free. In addition, not only do we get those nice standard network firewall, great functionalities, it also comes with another service, which for a lot of organizations is another device for network denial of service protection. That comes with it. And then when uh, AFM was created, that was when we first created our IP intelligence product, but this is actually not included with AFM. And the main reason is, this uses, we use a service, 
to get our updated IP information. So we pay licensing for the use of this, of this feature, so we have to pass that cost to the users of it. But it's a great feature. So when you're using AFM, they can also license IP intelligence for additional security as well. So a lot of good benefits we have with AFM. So as a network firewall, this is how things take place when it comes to AFM. One of the concerns I do hear from time to time, people say, you know, I like the idea, I feel more comfortable knowing that I have this firewall and then I have a target, whatever it is, and requests have to go through that firewall. The fact they're on the same box mm, it makes me a little uncomfortable. Isn't that less secure? And the answer is no, it's not less secure. When I speak about AFM, I explain it in such a way that let's pretend it's actually off the box. It's actually outside of the box, which is why I've made this graphic just slightly outside of there. And that's where our firewall protection is taking place. And the requests that are coming in, here I have a request coming in from the UK. Every request that comes in at this point, it must match a rule, an AFM rule, or it's not going any farther. Not going any farther into the big IP. So I have my rule list that we create. And you'll see here they're accessing 10.1.10.20 on port 80. So they're going to match that second rule and they're going to be allowed. Everything's fine. Only then does AFM pass the traffic to LTM. If it does not pass AFM, it does not go to LTM at all. Just doesn't. Just like this. If it doesn't go through here, it's not taking this hop there. No different. Here we have another request coming in. This one from Syrian Arab Republic. It's going to 10.1.10.20.443. Hey, it does match this third rule. It matches two rules. But just like any firewall, we take the action of the first rule we match. So we have another rule that's dropping requests from that source. And another big feature with AFM is the same feature we've had with AS, ASM and some of, many of our other products, DNS, IP geolocation. I don't have to go in and configure all the IP address ranges of Syria. I can just say source, Syria, that's it, be done with it. So this request will be dropped. And if we've configured it to do so, that can also generate a log entry that gets sent to my syslog server. So that's the workflow. We'll go through all that. The key thing that I, when it comes to position, when it comes to use, when it comes to talking about this, we just have to make sure, I, I go through the same conversation with our, own, our new SEs as well, how do we discuss and how do we position AFM? Think about what our product, Big IP, typically does. What we typically are involved in is accepting requests from external users somewhere who are trying to access internal applications of some sort meaning those requests always come through Big IP to go down here. And the fact they're going through Big IP means we can do things here. We can examine it, we can manipulate it, modify it, enhance it, whatever. And that's what AFM is. AFM is an inbound network firewall. It's a standard inbound network firewall. We don't want to position it in any other way at all, meaning it's not Palo Alto doesn't have the capabilities of a Palo Alto next generation firewall. What it does have, aside from everything I showed you on the previous slide of all the benefits, it also has usage, usable statistics, not usable, uh, user statistics that other firewall hardware platforms cannot accomplish. We can't get these kinds of numbers on some, any other competitors' firewalls. So even under heavy attack, we're under a heavy DDoS attack, 
much more likely the big IP is going to withstand it and stay online than some of our competing network firewalls. That'll do a good job, but may just get overwhelmed. There's only so much they can handle. So it's not an outbound. For those who are not familiar with that, I'm not as familiar with it. I understand the idea. Outbound firewalls, it's kind of like our secure web gateway product where I can monitor what my internal users are doing out to the internet. What kind of applications are they accessing? I can control that as a firewall. That is not AFM. Does that mean if I have some internal users here and they're going out through the big IP, does that mean I can't use AFM at all in here? Of course I can. I can use AFM on any virtual server. So if there's a virtual server here, we can use AFM, but we can still just use it for what we can use it for, firewall rules, not next generation firewall capabilities. And I don't see us going that place, going there at F5 either. I've never heard any rumors that we're trying to move in that direction. So, logging. This is, uh, if you had done, if you had had, had a chance to do the DOS exercise, you would have already done this. They actually go through this process in the DOS exercise. They create a, DOS, a log profile. They create it for bot defense so they can get that bot defense log. So at this point, it's very likely this might even be review for them. Um, but the log profile is what we use with ASM, AFM, Layer 7 DOS, Layer 4 and 3 and 4 DOS, to capture all the log data that's taking place to send it off somewhere. So with one log profile, give it a name here, I can enable any of these many different big F5 services. And for each one, I can selectively pick the kind of log data I want to see. So for example, what I mean by that is I'm only going to do network firewall logging at this time. So I've selected that. I have a tab now down at the bottom for network firewall. The publisher. The publisher is something you set up as a global, that's a global object on the big IP. And the publisher points to one or more places. A publisher might point to a syslog location, a Splunk location, and possibly the local big IP so I can get log data in all three. We don't typically recommend you do logging on the local big IP in production, but it's great for troubleshooting and checking things out. We're just using a default publisher, which just publishes to the local big IP. So that's the first thing is, where am I sending the log data? And then everything else is, what am I logging? What data am I gonna log? So we have all of these different kinds of events that we can log. This is your basic firewall rule matching. Do I want to log every time somebody is accepted by a rule? Maybe, maybe not. Every time they're dropped, every time they're rejected, TCP errors, IP errors, and so forth. For each one of these options, we can select to log every request that comes through, or we can rate limit how many per second log messages we want to send. So we have direct control of how much log data we actually push off to the syslog server, right in here. In addition, under storage format, this also gives us control of how much log data because we can select all of the available fields about each log entry that we want to send to the log server. So for example, maybe I don't need all these fields. Maybe I just want the date and time of the request, the source information of the request, the destination information, the action, was it accepted, rejected, dropped, whatever else. So we now have all the settings of what we want to log. And I have this log profile now. What do you suppose I'm gonna attach this log profile to? What was that? What am I going to attach this log profile to? Virtual virtual server. Server. Thank you, a virtual server. I have to be awake, so I'm going to make you guys be awake. Make you be nice and loud. Keep you awake. 
So yes, we go to the virtual server, policies page, down at the bottom, by default, logging is disabled. We can enable it, and then select the log profile that we created. That's all it takes. Now this is another nice, flexible thing about F5, big IP. I could have 20 applications, 20 virtual servers, and maybe I only need log data for 10 of them. That's a good thing. I don't have to waste my you know, log server, fill that up with log data from stuff I don't need. So the fact that we can enable logging on the virtual server level is a really nice thing. And then and each virtual server can use a different log profile. So I could have two virtual servers that are sending log data to the Splunk server and two virtual servers that are sending log data to syslog. This one logs a lot more data. This one just logs, you know, whatever. So we got all that flexibility. That's a nice thing. All right, so now you're going to have to wake up because I have some questions for you, and I, and I need some answers. <laughs> I need some answers, but these are easy questions. These are not challenging questions. I'm not trying to challenge you here. I have a brand new big IP system. We just got it, took it out of the box. We plugged it into the network. At this point, what traffic can get through that big IP system? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing? Why not? Because we're default denied. Looks like I was just one jump ahead of my uh, animation. My apologies, I know. Bad me. So, default denied. Good. Now, we've created a virtual server. Our first virtual server for this pool of servers, uh, web servers down here. So now, what traffic can get through the big IP system? Web traffic. Which one? Web traffic. Web traffic to? To one So at this point, any traffic going to that IP address on that port gets through. This shouldn't be challenging. This should be complete review for you. Now let's say we have another company and they bought a new network firewall. <coughs> I don't care which one. A competitor. Any competing network firewall. They just plug that into the network. Now what traffic do you suppose by default can get through this new network firewall? Cloud? Any, any. There's really only two answers. Anything or nothing? Anything. You say anything? Nothing. Perfect. You say nothing. Most firewalls. Okay. Most firewalls what? Most firewalls are default deny. They require rules to be set up. Nothing gets through most network firewalls without firewall rules. Clear on that? Yeah. So now let's go to the next step here. This administrator has heard about AFM, so they decided to provision AFM. AFM is a network firewall. So now Big IP is a network firewall. So now, what traffic do you suppose can get through that big IP? What happened to that firewall? Uh, nothing. That's irrelevant here. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so now anything that the AFM allows in the policy, as it accepts. All I did was provision AFM, so I don't even have the answer to that question. All I did was provision AFM. Nothing. I turned the big IP into a network firewall, because that's no, what AFM is. Nothing's going to get through. So you say nothing's going to get through. Again, there's really only two answers here. Nothing. It is beta fixed. Or or what do you say? I think uh, it is beta fixed going to go through to the VIP server. So you're saying traffic going can go here. Yes. Let's take a look. You're right. Oh. So traffic going to that virtual server can still get through. But here's an interesting point. Here's an interesting requirement. Remember I told you AFM is really off the box. It's really here. And I also told you something else. I said requests have to match a rule before they go through. Well, I just said all I did was provision it. I didn't create any rules. So that sounds curious. 
That sounds confusing, but we'll explain that in a few more minutes, how and why that happens. Why does it allow traffic when no rules have been created? So there's really two, there's really two answers, to the, there's two parts to this answer. The first part of the answer, I heard you mention it here, the first part of this answer is that AFM has two modes it can act in, two different modes. The default mode, I call it the same thing, I call it ADC mode. The default mode I call ADC mode. You could figure this under the top level options for network firewall. And these are the two, uh, these are the default settings. And these are the two fields, the two settings we're specifically talking about. By default, traffic going to any configured virtual servers or self IPs, basically listeners, any listeners, traffic going to any virtual servers or self IPs, what should Big IP do with it? What should AFM do with it, excuse me? AFM should accept it. Any other traffic? Any other traffic, what should AFM do with it? Either reject it or drop it. What's the difference between those two? Who can explain the difference between reject and drop and impress everybody in the room? Drop is silent. Drop is silent. Reject will have some form. What is that? How, how would a user be able to tell they're going to a website? <coughs> how could a user tell if they've been rejected versus dropped? They can tell. If they're being rejected, as David said, we get a, 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 res a message sent back to the browser that says, sorry, can't do it. And the browser tells us that immediately. So when I reject it, I immediately get a page that says, sorry, you can't access it. When it's dropped, it's silently dropped, meaning there's no response sent back to the browser. So my browser is just sitting there waiting for a response, waiting for a response. And I see it spinning and spinning and waiting and waiting and waiting. Typically, people consider that more secure because we're not giving any information out, but users find that irritating. But we can't change that to accept, you'll notice. We can't override the whole concept of a network firewall, which is what that would do. That's the default setting. So keep in mind, if I have, let's say, I only have one virtual server on my big IP. I'll do that. So by default, it's reject? Yes. The, the global context. Not the global. The global context, yes. So let's say I have 10.1.10.20 10 colon 80. That's my only virtual server. And I'm using this default mode. Do I need to now create accept, an accept rule to accept traffic to this virtual server? No. no. We just said, I don't need that. So more often than not, when you're using this mode, you don't have to create a lot of accept rules. All your virtual servers are already accepted. More often than not, you might just create reject rules. Let's say I want to reject Syria and North Korea and you know, some other places for whatever reasons. But if we chose to, we could change the mode of AFM to a true network firewall, a true default deny device like a competing network firewall. And we would do that by changing this first option from accept to either reject or drop. As soon as I do that, any requests going to any virtual servers that are already configured and any new virtual servers and any self IPs will be rejected unless there has been a rule created by the administrator. Because of that, when you use this method, you're typically going to be creating a lot of accept rules. Now, why do you suppose our developers, since this is like, like a, acting, behaving like a true firewall, why do you suppose our developers did not make this the default action when you provision AFM? I think because 
if you do that, as soon as you provision AFM, all live traffic will be blocked, which will create a problem for a live network. Just a little problem. That's a joke. A little problem. I mean, imagine if we had a customer in production with 100 virtual servers, they're selling stuff, they're doing stock trading, and one of their network admins says, oh, somebody told me about this product we have available, I'm going to provision ASM. Boom, as soon as they do that, all virtual servers are blocked now until they start creating rules. Someone's going to get fired for that one. So that's kind of the mindset. Now, for you guys, well, you can share this or not with your, with your partners. My personal recommendation, if I had two options, if I go out to a customer and they already have big IP, they've got all their virtual servers, they want to use AFM, I'm going to recommend we go in ADC mode. But if it's a brand new big IP, brand new deployment, we're designing the architecture from scratch, I may recommend this mode. Any reason why? Any idea why? I do have a reason. Yeah, so that you've now got nothing to lose and you should do it properly. You should take a So now you've got nothing to lose because you don't have existing traffic going through that. Okay. Box. But so still there has to be a reason other than that. There has to be like a, a reason I have to give the customer. When it comes to security in general, think of a shared folder on the network. A shared folder. The, usually the default permission on a shared folder is everyone. Full access. What is the general rule of security in situations like that? Do I give users as the most access any possible user could ever possibly want or need? Is that the best use is that the best way to do security? What's the best way to do security? What's usually the recommendation? Like read only, give, give read only. The least privilege. Give people the least amount of security that they typically need. And this is the same idea. With the default mode, we essentially accept everything and just reject what I have said I want to reject. Here, I'm accepting nothing except for traffic I have said I want to accept and that in itself is just a little bit more secure than the other mode. So it just depends if they want to create a lot of accept rules. I already covered that. So there are three top level objects we can create in AFM that we can use to make uh, rule management much, much easier. Address lists, port lists, and schedules. We'll cover each one of these briefly. They're all configured under security, network firewall, we got our address lists. So an address list could be used for either blocking a bunch of addresses or accepting a bunch of addresses. But when I create an address list, it can include several things. Include network uh, IPv4 IP addresses, IPv6 IP addresses, network addresses, host names, geolocation uh, countries, geolocation regions, and any combination of all of these. So now I have this address list. Why do I use it? I'll use it in a bunch of rules. Well, imagine this scenario. Imagine I've got a hundred virtual servers, and for all those virtual servers, I want to block all of these addresses. I could go to each virtual server and create the rules to say block this, 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 and this, block this, 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 and this. Now that sounds like a lot of work, and it probably would be a lot of work to do that for all my virtual servers. That's not the worst part, though. What if, after the fact, my administrator says, oh, you know, we also need to block this region and this IP range. I have to then go back to every virtual server and add all of those. Or they might say, you know what, we want to stop blocking uh, this range here. Stop blocking that. I'd have to quickly go to 100 virtual servers and do that. Instead, when I configure my rules for my virtual servers, I say, 
block that address list, block that address list, block that address list. I do that for all my virtual servers. And now, if I need to block additional ranges, I just add it here in one place. Or if I need to stop blocking something, I can remove it here in one place. So it makes firewall management uh, rules much easier when you're man dealing with a lot of different objects like a lot of virtual servers. Same kind of thing applies to port lists. Imagine if my, um, my virtual server was not 10.1.10.20, .10 but it was 10.1.10.20. And star, all ports. So not just port 80, but my virtual server accepts traffic on all ports. That makes it real easy so that I can have my HTTP and my HTTP access on one virtual server, and even SSH access if I want, RDP access, it, anything you need. So imagine that. So I can create a new port list, same idea, give it a name. I'm going to define all of my application ports that we have, our our custom apps, we'll say, our custom Lorax application. We can include ports and port ranges. Same rule, same idea applies here. Use this in one or more rules. So again, going with this idea over here, I've got 100 virtual servers, and they all use all ports, every virtual server. So I could go to each virtual server and say, only allow these 10 ports only allow these 10 ports, only allow these 10 ports. I could do that for all 100 of my virtual servers, which again could take some time. But again, the real trick is what happens when my administrator says, oh, you know, we also want to allow this one other port. But I told you we wanted port 22. I, I, I don't want that. I, I, we got to stop that immediately. I've got to go to every virtual server now and change the ports. Instead, when I create my rules, I can say, accept these ports, accept these ports, and so on. And so now, if I need to add new ports, I add them here. If I can remove ports, I remove them there. So again, same idea. Ease of managing multiple file firewall rules. And then the third object I told you about, that's a top-level object we can create, is a schedule. To understand a schedule, first, you need to understand that every rule has three states. It's an enabled rule, a disabled rule, or a scheduled rule. So a firewall administrator said, I told you to remove port 22 because we don't want, we only want people to access port 22 on work hours. That's it. So without knowing this wonderful feature, that firewall manager would have to go in and disable that rule every night at five o'clock and then re-enable re re it again every morning at 8 o'clock. That's silly. Instead, we'll create a schedule. Let's give it a name. If we choose, we can configure some sort of a date range, or we can make it indefinite. We can configure a time range of the day. We can configure the days of the week. And then we can now use that schedule as the, as the, uh, the action, the state. For the rule. Very easy to do. So those are the three top level objects. The last thing we'll cover in this lesson is how to use AFM. How do I use AFM? How do I create rules? That's really what it's all about. That's why we're using the product. So to understand how to create rules, you'll need to be able to explain the concept of contests. How many of you actually come to this class with experience at other companies managing network firewalls. Managing firewalls, creating rules. Wow, only a couple of you. Okay. Well, you probably have, there are uh, uh, levels of where you create rules on firewalls that we don't have on Big IP. You don't create rules on the same types of objects as you do in network, network firewalls. Big IP, you create rules. On AFM, you create rules at a context level. And these are the contexts and the order that they are checked when a request arrives at AFM. The first context is a global context, which is what it sounds like. It's a rule that applies to the entire Big IP. If there is no 
no matching rule for this request at the global context. But it looks we can also set rules at the route domain level. That's another context. If there's no matching rule there, we'll then see if there's a rule assigned at the virtual server context. This is probably the most commonly used context that we have. Most people create the rules at the virtual server level. No rule apply, no rule here that matches. We can see if they're matching a rule at a self IP context. If they're not matching a rule there, we're running out of options. We're gonna, we can also check to see if they're accessing the management port because we don't create rules there. We don't typically, we don't essentially create rules at the management port. If you did, you truly could lock out the entire big IP. So we're checking to see are they accessing the management port? We'll give them access there. But if they don't match a rule, one of these levels, then they match the action of the global context. What is that? Well, we saw it earlier. The global context is that second option on the network firewall options. And remember, that can only be uh, reject or drop. So once again, I'll remind you, without matching a rule at one of these contexts, you're going to either be rejected or dropped. We never created any rules. How did those requests make it through then? We're getting there. So what's the difference between global and global context? There is a difference. Global is the global context. Global context is the context of the big IP. Rules that apply to the entire big IP. That's the global context. So because uh, and when we started, the first thing was global, right? Last one is global context. Oh, global context. You know what? I don't know why they call it this. It's just whatever applies here. I know it is a little odd. This is a global rule. This is the global context. This really should, this this shouldn't, if I was designing our UI, I wouldn't call it this. If I was designing our configuration utility, I would change this to maybe not matching anything. I don't know. I don't like the wording of that. But we have application developers that write our, our UI. Doesn't always make sense, I. But we're not the only company that has that problem. So if, if I change the virtual server example IP context to reject, does that mean that I will not get any access to the box at all? No, not at all. Because if, if you change this to reject. That means the default action is any request going to virtual server are going to be rejected unless there's a matching rule. So when you get to this context, there could still be a matching rule that you created, an accept rule that you created for that virtual server. But if there isn't, then you'll be rejected there, yes. Yes, so, so uh, if I just turn on the FF module without configuring any rules and I turn it with default reject, would, would I get knocked out of the box? Absolutely. You'd be locked out of the box unless you can get to the management port. I can't remember if I actually have you do that in this exercise. I've had to trim this exercise down, so I may have removed that. I'll double check when we do it. But the, the SEs do that. They actually lock themselves out of the box, but you can still get into the management port. But you can't get in through self IDs anymore. If you, again, if you change this to reject. That's actually why we do that exercise, so you can see that that actually is, in fact, a thing, an issue. Was there a question over here? Uh, I would ask about the self IP context. Uh, is it uh, traffic that has the destination IP address of self IP? I mean, traffic going to that self IP, or any traffic going through that self IP? So, the only people that the only time people access the self IP is when they're typically accessing. They want to access the configuration utility from home. So we can now create rules that allow or block that. So for example, I could set up rules to say you can only access the self IP, the external self IP, if you're connecting from this subnet, which is my corporate subnet or my remote office subnet, or I could block all requests to the self IP from all these geolocations. But that's, I mean, the only people that are using the self IP, they're not using it to go through. They're using it to get to the configuration utility, other outside of using the management port. I mean, there are, you're right.
right, there are other uses for self IPs, and I can't quite right now think how to answer the question for that context. I'd have to think about it a little bit, like, what if I've got a service that's using a self IP? Same rule would apply, it would have to match a rule. So if you had like a server, a service server, that access something through the big IP and it used the self IP address, there would just there would have to be a rule that matched whatever that request was. And you would create a rule for that. That would be fine. You wouldn't have to worry about that if you kept this. You'd only have to worry about that if you changed that to reject or drop. Then you would have to take that into consideration. Any type of activity out there that's using a self IP address will be affected and will need to be addressed, have rules made. But there's certainly a lot to be said for locking down your self IPs. That's a good thing. Kind of thing. I have never used a packet filter. Um, I don't think they're going to conflict with each other. I don't know if you need to use it if you're using this now. I don't have a, really any experience with packet filters. So I, I, a lot of times when I, I don't know if I shared this with you on Monday, when it comes to questions, you know, I don't, I don't always have the answers. You guys won't always have the answers. Never make up an answer. Ask what they want you to look it up. But for me, I also say, a lot of times I have a pretty strong feeling. I'm not positive, but my gut feeling is this. I even have a gut feeling about this because I just don't have any experience with packet filters. But you could try it. Try something in your lab environment and, and see if you could make that work. If you have experience with using packet filters, you know how to do it. I've never even created a packet filter before in Big IP. Sorry. All right. So. Just like with ASM, the top level object here is called a policy. We're going to create a policy, and a policy is going to be a collection of all of the rules that we're going to apply to a specific context. So we'll have one policy for the global context. We'll have one policy for every virtual server context. One policy for every self IP context. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to have one for every context, but that's the idea. One policy per context. If you first create the policy, just give it some basic name. You'll see there's not much else here. Once you've got the policy, then maybe we want to start creating some rules. What are more rules for that policy? So for that, I can go into the policy. And then we have the option over here to create rules. You can either create it at the beginning or the end, and of course you can reorder it at any time after the fact. So all of the uh, all of the stuff you're going to do in a rule are all is all in here. For example, the name of the rule, the state. Remember our states: enabled, disabled, scheduled. If I choose scheduled. Then I'll have to pick the schedule that I just created. Your protocols, wide variety of protocols there. Most of your firewall rules for stuff like this, port 22, port 80, port 443, we're going to need to use either TCP, maybe UDP. Or as our UPD. Hmm? Or maybe UPD. Which one? UPD. Oh, oh, oh you, you, UDP. That's a U, UPD, that's a new protocol. Ah, thank you. You're such a sassy one. I'm so glad I beat you last night in bowling. I put you in your place. This is the kind of stuff I need you guys to tell me about when you catch it. See, I got it right here. Okay, so our protocol. There we go, is that better? Thank you. Um, then we've got our source. So this could be a combination of several things. You know, where is the request coming from? It can, of course, be IP address.
addresses and network addresses. All the stuff we saw earlier in an address list could be in the source, but of course we could also just use an address list. So in this case, I actually am using an address list, but I've also got a couple of additional source items in here as well. You can, so you can combine them together. Same thing with your destination. This can be a combination of ports, uh, port ranges. It also could be addresses too. So uh, for example, I'm gonna get your question here in a second. Let's say, this is not my virtual server. Let's say my virtual server is actually 10.1.10.0.24. So it's a network address, the network virtual server. So I've now got one virtual server for 200 some odd possible backend uh, uh, requests. So now, if this was the case, I could actually make my destination rules include the destination IP. Only 10.1.10.50, 10.1.10.60, whatever. Yes. Okay. Uh, my question is that uh, if we have a little like this and we specify the destination, and the destination IP is not the virtual server, the destination IP is there some, some IP behind it. It would be the destination IP. No, it would not, because remember, this is this is AFM here. This is LTM. Oh. AFM is looking at what LTM has. A we're looking at the virtual servers in question here. That's a perfect question. It's an excellent question when you might get a lot. Then we have our actions, accept, reject, drop. We've already talked about those. You'll see an additional action here, a little odd, accept decisively. We're going to talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Another fairly new feature that we added, uh, I don't have a lot of great use cases for it because this is one of those features, quite honestly, that just so they appeared in the product and I didn't get a, I never saw any real explanation of why. I understand how to use it. I'm just not really sure if maybe a customer wanted this product or this feature. The idea here, though, is if somebody matches this rule, I could then just direct them to a different virtual server. And then finally, logging. So here is another place where I can control how much log data I want to generate. So not only do I only log to whatever virtual server has a logging profile, I will only log rules that have the logging enabled. So once I'm done with this, over on the left side of the screen, we have the button to done editing. And another fairly new change we made with AFM, fairly new, it used to be that every time you completed a rule, you clicked on finished, it did what, what is called a compiling the rule. It compiled it within the AFM engine, very similar to applying changes in ASM. A lot of changes, a lot of policy changes. So every time you created a rule, it applied the changes, so to speak. Um, and sometimes administrators didn't want that. They want to be able to create two, five, ten rules at a time before it's all applied. <coughs> so that is the case now. So I could now do several things at once before I commit it. So just think of this as ASM's button that says apply policy change or apply policy. And now I've got my rule done. So that's creating our first rule. Now I've got to do something with this policy. What am I going to do with this policy? What am I going to attach it to? Whoops. Yes, but that's not the only thing. I could also attach it to global. I could also attach it to round domain. You need to attach it to a context. You need to attach it to some context. Exactly. If I'm going to attach it to a virtual server, you do it in the exact same place that you would attach all of our other stuff, security related. Interesting note, if you go to a self IP screen just like this, you will see the self IP screen also has this security menu because this is where you would apply the policy to a self IP as well. So once I'm on 
on this page. I've got my Narek firewall enforced and staging. The idea of staging, it's not quite the same as staging of ASM. No, no, I shouldn't say not quite the same. It is not the same as staging of ASM. What this means is put the firewall rules in place, but don't enforce them. Just let me see all the logging. I want to see what is being accepted and dropped and rejected, even though nobody's actually being dropped and rejected. So I can see what's going to be happening before it happens. I enforced the policy. I'm going to choose enforcement enabled, and I'll pick that new policy, and that's all it takes. Now we're good. Now we're done. So there's a couple of other tools we have to make this easier for our administrators. This is probably the main tool for firewall management ease for administrators. It's called the Active Rules page. This page is used to view all the firewall rules on this big IP. You can view them all, you can modify them, you can add new rules, you can delete rules, you can reorder rules. The idea is, and this is where a lot of changes were made with AFM in the last three or four years, is we used to have to go to multiple pages to manage rules. And firewall administrators don't like that. They want everything on one spot. So that's what we have now here on this page. By default, this page only displays the global context if there is a policy attached there. There may not even be a policy attached if you haven't yet created one. But I have, so I can see my policy with all the rules in place. And you'll notice one of my rules is using this interesting action called accept decisively. So let me explain what this means at this time. So let's say I have this rule here. I have this rule here that says SSH maintenance. So this says at the global level, any source can access port 22 on a schedule during work hours. And let's say that was set to accept and not accept decisively. Let's just say that. But then also I've got 10 virtual servers. And on one of my virtual servers, an administrator created a reject rule for port 22. The way that AFM works when we're checking hierarchy, looking for a rule match, is when I match a rule at the global context, I'm trying to do port 22 access on this virtual server. We go down, check the global context. Oh, look, I match this global rule of accept. SSH maintenance. But <clears throat> AFM's going to say, you know what, I'm just going to go check and see if this request maybe matches something more specific at the self IP or the virtual server context level. And I get to the, to the virtual server and oh look, I do match a rule there that says to reject SSH access. So for that virtual server, I'm going to be rejected. All my other virtual servers I can access. Well, my Big IP administrator finds out about this and says, wait a minute, that's not what I wanted. I wanted all administrators to be able to manage virtual servers with SSH. So they can change the action to accept decisively. This really only applies to global rules. And what it means is now, if I match a rule at the global context as accept decisively, I will be accepted, but no more rules are going to be looked at. And I would now be able to access that uh, virtual server on SSH. So that's accept decisively. Other stuff we see on this screen, we've got some rather interesting statistics for you, if you like. We can get probably much better statistics on our Splunk server, but, you know, there's some interesting stuff there. You'll also notice here at the bottom, there's this default line. This default line maps directly to this context, the global, we'll call this the global reject or drop context. I like that better, the global reject or drop context. This is what happens to any users, this is the rule, that applies to any requests that don't match a rule in any other context. 
something that didn't match a rule in any context. Now, what if my administrator wants to work with the virtual server and the rules? We can do that. We're just going to select the item we want to manage here. We're going to manage a virtual server, and we're going to manage the Lorax virtual. In our previous version of this, the previous AFM version of this, uh, this was not a default. The default was that we just showed all rules on this page immediately. And I believe that the reason this was changed was because if a, an AFM uh, uh, deployment had 500 rules, imagine this page, so long. So this way we just sort of limit what we're working on at any one time. So now I still see my global context, but I'm going to scroll down to see my virtual server context. So what that means is your global context never goes away from the screen. You always see that. But I can now view my virtual server context. And you'll notice the virtual server context also has a default line. And this default line, the action, matches this action. So we were talking earlier and questioning why and how does AFM let traffic through to a virtual server if there are no rules created yet? But there actually was a rule created. As soon as we provision AFM, every virtual server Every self IP got its own default rule. And the action is whatever was configured here. So if this was changed to reject or drop, the default rule for every virtual server and self IP would be reject or drop. So let's take a look here. I have, yes. Nothing to do with the global context. Nothing to do with the global context. This is this is directly no, no, mass. This, the one at the bottom. To this. Yeah, no, I mean the one at the bottom. Oh, the one at the bottom is whatever is mapped to this. Right. So, so there's a default at the bottom and then there's a default just above that. It's just above it for now. But this is all we see on the screen. So imagine this, if you can see this, I'll try to make this nice and big. I'm not used to such small whiteboards. So if I was expanding this out and I, I could actually see everything, I might have global at the top. Then I have VIP1, VIP2, VIP3, self IP. One default bottom, and then each one of these has a default. Default, so forth. So when I'm looking to see a match, if my request matches the IP of this virtual server, this is going to be the rule that I might match. I'll never make it down here. But if I don't match a rule here, I'm not matching that one, I'm not matching that one, or that one, or that one. That's going to be the rule I eventually match. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, it does. So there's a default per context. Per context. And then there's an overall default. Correct. Huh? But these cannot be changed independent of each other. They all have the exact same setting, whatever this is. And similarly, the, okay, that's just one. So and this just has whatever this is. So with that in mind, here's my question. What if, so right now, I have a rule that says accept traffic from all of these sources on all of these ports, and inside of this is port 80, 443, we'll say that. Somebody from the US right now tries to request that virtual server on Telnet. Port 23. Oh, I'm sorry, not tell that. Well, let's say it is tell that. Let's tell that. Well, great. They're going to match this rule. They're coming from the US. They got matching port 23. Fantastic. Somebody else tries to request that virtual server on port 
if somebody from the U.S. is trying to access my Lorax virtual on port 3389, will they be accepted, rejected, or drunk? Make the, let's make it easier. What rule will they match? Which default rule?
have very specific reasonings. Not in my head, I'm just saying that's the scenario here. So we're ensuring that only these sources can access the virtual server, and they can access it only on these ports as well. And anything else, any other places, any other ports, will now successfully be rejected. Does that answer? But if it's just 10.1.10.20 colon 80. It's, it's, it's just that uh, it will make more sense if the default rule is any any drop. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just. Rather than Maybe so. everything specifically and then to accept everything is... And you know what? That all just comes to when you start... If, if you have partners that are actually managing this, in real world scenarios, you're going to have a hundred different possibilities. As long as you understand how to do it, that's all that matters. Then you can adapt to every possibility. That's the, and so the key to this class is so they understand how to do it. I had this discussion last week a few times with somebody. It's like, you know, I can't, I cannot teach you guys, and you guys can't teach your partners every possible scenario that might end up happening with our products. It's just not possible. Um, you just, all you can teach them is how to use them so that they get to understand how to work with some of these different things. But, you know, even my SEs, I tell them that I can teach them how to start with ASM and APM, but their knowledge is going to come once they're out working with it and selling it and, and working in and, and so forth. That's where they learn all their real world stuff. Question. So um, this, this default uh, allow rule or default accept rule, uh, for, so this is only applicable to uh, virtual servers. And self IPs. And self IPs. Correct. But not to things like route domain and all that. Other context, no. Uh, route. I had to look at a, a route domain. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't have a lot of exposure to route domains. So all you have to do is go into a route domain. If you have route domains, go into it. Go to the security page. You'll see exactly what the default rule is. I'm not positive. Okay. Yes. Can I change the default? Before right here, uh, can you do zero loss of and self IP? Do we get contract? How would you do it? Anybody have an answer to that? No, you can't because it's, it points to that one thing, right? You can change it, but you change it for the whole big IP, not just for that one default. If I self up or configure the global VS, can I change both the weekend? I'm not sure if I understand. Anybody help me out? If, I, uh, if already properly configured on the load, everything is okay. And then uh, I change the VS and SFRT to reject and default is reject. Okay, so you changed the default setting to reject. <coughs> okay. Default is reject, so both reject and reject. Okay. All properly configured with the load. Is it okay? I'm still not catching the last part of that. No, I think what he's trying to say is that once he is he's kind of allowed what he wants to allow, yes. then can he change the mode of the firewall from the ADC mode to the... Absolutely, but you may want to put it in the staging policy first, just to ensure you're not blocking inadvertently requests. Again, if you have the, if you have the ability to change the firewall mode to be true firewall, and it's not going to harm your application deployment, your deliveries, I think great. I think you definitely could do that. But you would just want to make sure that you've accounted for all traffic that needs to come through every virtual server and every self IP, yes. then you could change that default action, yes. So there's so that there's no false positive. I think yeah I got your point. Yeah. So that's the thing which concerned. So but you said staging, right? So so in staging, what happens? It generates logs, but it doesn't... It just generates logs, correct. Oh, okay. So That's it's basically intransferable. Ah, transferable. Okay. Good question. Um, FFs only apply to those standards which are similar to like IP voting which are similar? Any virtual server. Any virtual server. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any of your virtual servers. So you could have... Absolutely. So you could... In fact, that even makes sense. Because yeah, because yeah, sometimes we just want yeah. To them. I want so to uh, so uh, the question the scenario: I have an IP forwarding 
So everything from this VLAN, I'm forwarding to this VLAN, but I could create a reject rule for these couple of specific subnets or something. They can't do it. You know, totally possible. Any virtual server? Uh, this, this, again, I answer uh, from the first slide. <laughs> yeah. I noticed that in the uh, table. Uh, when we create the policy or role, can we define the destination IP destination IP address? No. You mean here? Yeah. Uh, can we define the destination IP address? Because I see that Absolutely. the destination port. Anything in the source, uh, the source could be any IP address, any network address, any port. You don't oh, okay. typically look at requests based on their source port, but you could. Anything on destination could be any IP address, any network address, any port. So you just actually, when you're, when you're filling these in, you literally just type an IP address, hit enter. Type a port, hit enter. And you'll see a combination of stuff here. You see, actually it's a bit confusing because I think where it's coming from, I understand. Usually it's like source IP, you know, source port. Destination IP, destination port. That's I agree, that's how it used to look. That's so how it used we see to this, look. Right? So it's like, yeah, where is the... That's how it used to look. And we changed it like this because this is a firewall, a lot of, from what I understand, this is what a lot of firewall rule uh, administrators are, are used to. They don't want two fields. They don't want a field for IP and then port. They just want to put everything in here. Just plug in all the destination information here. Boom, boom. Source. Everything is destination based, plug it in there. Okay. It's easier for them. And that's how it's done now. All right, we're getting a lot of good questions, but I am at some point going to cap them. Otherwise, we're going to go very long. Uh, Just have, one from you. <laughs> <laughs> we have some uh, POC uh, customers that we have a multiple instant of port. Multiple, it be, oh, really? yeah, multiple, uh, multiple uh, one, uh, one IP, multiple uh, service port. And then we do, uh, on our FL, can we do the... Uh, multiple policy that we can call to another context or sub-policy? No sub-policies. What was the first so part of the question? Eliminate the long policies So we can call a policy, one policy or multiple objects or policies that we can call to another context. Multiple policies that you can port to? Sub-policies, things like that. I'm not sure if I'm understanding the, the use case or the, the, the question here. So you've got. So that, uh, so that we can reduce the maximum. Reduce the number of policies? Yeah, yeah. So well, you only policy. have one policy per virtual server. If you're saying you want to use the same policy for more than one virtual server, I don't know if you can do that or not. Uh, you have to try that. It might be possible. I think maybe it is possible. I'm not positive. But I have to, I have to try it. Um, before we go further on that question, maybe on your exercise, maybe just try. You have more than one virtual server in this environment. So if you have a couple of extra minutes, you could try to see if you can attach the policy you create for Lorax Virtual, see if you could attach it to one of the virtuals. I've never tried it before. I will say this much though. When you're using Big IQ for managing network firewalls, you can use policies that you created here on all of these other AFMs. So that's why I feel like it is possible. I just haven't tried it. Okay, we're gonna move on here. So approval lists are like address lists and port lists. Something I'm gonna to use to save time when I'm working with lots of, let's say, lots of virtual servers. I've got 20 virtual servers, and I want the same set of rules for all 20 virtual servers. I can create a rule list called my Lorax web apps. When I create it, now down here on the right side of the page, I can click on add, and then I can add one rule, add another rule, add another rule. Each rule can be a source, a destination, a protocol, uh, action, logging. Each rule can include all of that. When I'm done, I can have multiple rules like this. So now my rule list says, reject traffic from these areas, 
And then he set track on port 3389, port 23, and port FTP. And now I can use this rule list in more than in one or more contexts. So again, the same example, if I wanted all of those rules for all 20 of my virtual servers, I could have just created the rules on each virtual server. I could have done that. But if we decided later, oh, you know what? We also wanted a rule to accept anything on another, we got another rule for every virtual server. You'd have to go back to each virtual server and add this additional rule. We are using a rule list. You can add and remove and reorder all your rules here in one spot, which will affect every virtual server that uses the rule list. Great time-saving tip, and watch how easy it is to use the rule list on the active rules page. This is like the easiest. So I'll now choose to add a rule list to the virtual server. Well, I got one item here, and I can literally just start typing the name of the rule list I created and select it. Click on Done Editing. And there's my rule list. You'll notice it's got like a little stop sign indicator, which usually indicates something's not right, something's wrong. Anyone have an idea what else I need to do to fully implement that rule list? Have you committed your changes? I need to commit my changes at the top. I have to commit the changes to the system. As soon as I do that, now you can see it looks like a little plus sign because I can click on that plus sign and I can see the rules that are in that rule list. And I can now look at all of my rules together for this virtual server. They will now look for this first. They might get rejected. Then they can do this, 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 then this. At the very bottom, I have my reject all and I'm good to go. Last thing on this page, I told you that uh, this page was designed so we really could almost manage everything that administrators need to manage regularly. So over here on the right, there's this little uh, icon pop-up, and this lets us see all of these lists, these port lists, address lists, schedules, and so forth either the ones we've already created, or we could create new ones right from here. So for example, I can go to port lists, and I could use this button to create a new one. Or I can click on the existing one, and then down at the bottom here, I can work with it. I can click on this gear icon to edit it, so I can add some new ports, I can remove ports, do whatever this I want. Great. This is really useful. It's very useful, because everything we do here immediately affects anything that's using these objects out here once I commit changes to the system. So again, all firewall management is done now on this one page. That was the goal for our developers. Last couple things, and then you can find your exercise. We have our log, just like our ASM log and our bot defense log. We have our firewall log, network firewall. A few things about this page. Just like a lot of our logs, the bot defense is the same. A lot of our logs, there's a lot of data on this one page. You, I can't see it all. Your laptops can't see it all. I like to always give this keyboard shortcut, control minus key, makes your you know, page zoom out, however much your eyes can see. I still can't see everything. Um, but you'll see, I can see the policy that was matched, the rule that was matched, and so forth. I can sort any of these columns, I can actually filter out, let's say I just want to see all the rules in this one policy that I created. Now I can see all the times this policy was activated and all the rules that were man, uh, you know, uh, activated within it. And then over on the right, uh, this is where you have the real meat of this firewall is who accessed it, what were they accessing, on what port, and what happened? Was it accepted, rejected, or dropped? 
So this is if you're doing local big IP logging, by the way. You won't be able to see this unless you're doing local big IP logging. This is the same type of log data that we push out to Splunk and Syslog. A lot of times I've heard, I've gotten questions from uh, people saying, can AFM do any kind of monitoring, or not monitoring, but alerting or monitoring, you know, based on this log activity? Can it tell an administrator this or do something? And that's not what, AFM is not a log server. It's not, that's not what the purpose of AFM or Big IP is. That's the purpose of your other log servers. So any of that kind of activity is typically done in your external log servers. We just provide the log data. There you go. And then, just like ASM, we have our great reports. The default AFM report displays, back there, look there, displays all of our contexts. So if you didn't understand AFM and you've never taken this class and you came here, you may not know what this means, rule contexts. Now hopefully you do. You'll see in there global. You'll see virtual servers. You'll see self-IPs. Those are all the contexts. And this is the number of times a rule, each context was matched in a rule. A request matched one of those rules in that context level. Sorry, I'm not speaking well here. I can change the start, start chart type like you guys did yesterday. because I just don't like this. Personally, I don't like this chart type. I, have a, I, I can't read it. It doesn't really mean anything to me. Whereas this makes a little more sense to me. And just like our other charts, there's so much you can do on here. So an example here is I can drill down into my uh, virtual server context. And now I can see all of the rules that were matched for that virtual server and how many times each one was matched. I can drill down even farther to my reject rule. And the default display here is the destination ports. I can see every port that was rejected and how many times it was rejected. And as I mentioned, in a lot of demos, a lot of exercises, at any time we can click on, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, this is to say, these all let you just fully customize what's on here. You can change the date range, where's that? You can change the date to two weeks ago from this hour to this hour. You can fully customize whatever is on these report pages. And whatever I'm viewing on this time, that's what we get when we export. When we get our printable PDF. And that actually is usually a big seller on demos. People like to see that. All right. Um, any questions first that we didn't already address? Hoping not. Just for time. Not that I don't like the questions. Uh, I want to see what time it is here so I know what time you give people. Wow, it's already 11 o'clock. Okay. Um, so my guess is we're going to probably do this exercise. It, we haven't even had a break. So let's, I'm going to give you until lunchtime. So as soon as you start this, if you want to step out, get a beverage and use the restroom, you have from now until about noon. We'll take lunch at noon. This will take you up to maybe 50 minutes. And the idea now is you're going to access your environment using the link that I emailed to you. This is the way your students will access it, and it should follow the book pretty clearly, where they just go to their landing portal and click on RDP, and then it's the same way you've been doing it up until now. You just go to your remote desktop, uh, desktop do your exercise. So you're going to do everything we've covered. You're going to create a log profile, you're going to create a policy, you're going to create a rule list, you're going to add to the virtual server, you're going to test it out, match some rules for accept, match some rules for reject, and then view your logs and your reports. So let me know if you have questions while you're working on the exercise, and otherwise we'll see you guys at lunchtime.
firewall uh, administrators said, I told you to remove port 22 because we don't want, we only want people to access port 22 on work hours. That's it. So without knowing this wonderful feature, that firewall manager would have to go in and disable that rule every night at 5 o'clock and then re-enable re -re -re it again every morning at 8 o'clock. That's silly. Instead, we'll create a schedule. Let's give it a name. If we choose, we can configure some sort of a date range, or we can make it indefinite. We can configure a time range of the day. We can configure the days of the week. And then we can now use that schedule as the, as the, uh, the action, the state for the rule. Very easy. So those are the three top-level objects. The last thing we'll cover in this lesson is how to use AFM. How do I use AFM? How do I create rules? That's really what it's all about. That's why we're using the product. So to understand how to create rules, you'll need to be able to explain the concept of contests. How many of you actually come to this class with experience at other companies managing network firewalls. Managing firewalls, creating rules. Wow, only a couple of you, okay. Well, you probably have, there are uh, uh, levels of where you create rules on firewalls that we don't have on Big IP. You don't create rules on the same types of objects as you do in network, network firewalls. On Big IP, you create rules. On AFM, you create rules at a context level. And these are the contexts and the order that they are checked when a request arrives at AFM. The first context is a global context, which is what it sounds like. It's a rule that applies to the entire big IP. If there is no matching rule for this request at the global context, then it looks, we can also set rules at the route domain level. Another context. If there's no matching rule there. We'll then see if there's a rule assigned at the virtual server context. This is probably the most commonly used context that we have. Most people create the rules at the virtual server level. No rule fly, no rule here that matches. We can see if they're matching a rule at a self-IP context. If they're not matching a rule there, we're running out of options. We're going to, we can also check to see if they're accessing the management port because we don't create rules there. We don't typically, we don't essentially create rules of the management port. If you did, you truly could lock out the entire big IP. So we're checking to see are they accessing the management port? We'll give them access there. But if they don't match a rule at one of these levels, then they match the action of the global context. What is that? Well, we saw it earlier. The global context is that second option on the network firewall options. And remember, that can only be uh, reject or drop. So once again, I'll remind you, without matching a rule at one of these contexts, you're going to either be rejected or dropped. We never created any rules. How did those requests make it through then? We're getting there. is the global context. Global context is the context of the big IP. Rules that apply to the entire big IP. That's the global context. So because uh, when, when we started, the first thing was global, right? Yes. And then the last one is global context. Oh, global context. You know what? I don't know why they call it this. It's just whatever applies here. I know it is a little odd. This is a global rule. This is the global context. This really should, this, this shouldn't, if I was designing our UI, I wouldn't call it this. If I was designing our configuration utility, I would change this to maybe not matching anything. I don't know. I don't like the wording of that. But we have application developers that write our, our UI. doesn't always make sense, I, but we're not the only company that has that problem. So if, you, if I change the virtual server example, I think, to reject. Does that mean that I will not get any 
No, not at all. Because if, if you change this to reject, that means the default action is any requests going to virtual server are going to be rejected unless there's a matching rule. So when you get to this context, there could still be a matching rule that you created, an accept rule that you created for that virtual server. But if there isn't, then you'll be rejected there. Yes. Yes. So, so uh, if I just turn on the FF module without configuring any rules and I turn it with default reject, would, would I get knocked out of the box? Absolutely. You'd be locked out of the box unless you can get to the management board. I can't remember if I actually have you do that in this exercise. I've had to trim this exercise down, so I may have removed that. I'll double check when we do it. But the, the SEs do that. They actually lock themselves out of the box, but you can still get into the management board. But you can't get in through self IDs anymore. If you, again, if you change this to reject. That's actually why we do that exercise, so you can see that that actually is, in fact, a thing, an issue. Was there a question over here? Uh, I would ask about the self IP context. Uh, is it uh, traffic that has the destination IP address of self IP? I mean, traffic going to that self IP, or any traffic going through that self IP? So, the only people that the only time people access the self IP is when they're typically accessing. They want to access the configuration utility from home. So we can now create rules that allow or block that. So for example, I could set up rules to say you can only access the self IP, the external self IP, if you're connecting from this subnet, which is my corporate subnet or my remote office subnet, or I could block all requests to the self IP from all these geolocations. But that's I mean, the only people that are using the self IP, they're not using it to go through. They're using it to get to the configuration utility, other outside of using the management board. I mean, there are, you're right, there are other uses for self IPs, and I can't quite right now think how to answer the question for that context. I'd have to think about it a little bit, like, what if I've got a service that's using a self IP? Same rule would apply, it would have to match a rule. So if you had like a server, service server that access something through the big IP and it used the self IP address, there would just there would have to be a rule that matched whatever that request was. And you would create a rule for that. That would be fine. You wouldn't have to worry about that if you kept this. You'd only have to worry about that if you change that to reject or drop. Then you would have to take that into consideration. Any type of activity out there that's using a self IP address will be affected and will need to be addressed, have rules made. But there's certainly a lot to be said for locking down your self IPs. That's a good thing. the big IP? Yeah. Packet filters are how we used to do this kind of thing. I have never used a packet filter. Um, I don't think they're going to conflict with each other. I don't know if you need to use it if you're using this now. I don't have a really any experience with packet filters. So I, I, a lot of times when I, I don't know if I shared this with you on Monday, when it comes to questions, you know, I don't, I don't always have the answers. You guys won't always have the answers. Never make up an answer. Ask what they want you to look it up. But for me, I also say, a lot of times I have a pretty strong feeling. I'm not positive, but my gut feeling is this. I even have a gut feeling about this because I just don't have any experience with packet filters. But you could try it. Try something in your lab environment and, and see if you could make that work. If you have experience with using packet filters, you know how to do it. I've never even created a packet filter before in Big IP. Sorry. All right, so just like with ASM, the top level object here is called a policy. We're going to create a policy, and a policy is going to be a collection of all of the rules that we're going to apply to a specific context. So we'll have one policy for the global context. We'll have one policy.
policy for every virtual server context, one policy for every self IP context. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to have one for every context, but that's the idea. One policy per context. You first create the policy, just get it some basic name. You'll see there's not much else here. Once you've got the policy, then maybe we want to start creating some rules. What are more rules for that policy? So for that, I can go into the policy. And then we have the option over here to create rules. You can either create it at the beginning or the end. And of course, you can reorder it at any time after the fact. So all of the, uh, all of the stuff you're going to do in a rule are all, is all in here. For example, the name of the rule, the state, remember our states, enabled, disabled, scheduled. If I choose scheduled, then I'll have to pick the schedule that I just created. Your protocols, wide variety of protocols there. Most of your firewall rules for stuff like this, port 22, port 80, port 443, we're going to need to use either TCP, maybe UDP. as our UPD. Hmm? Or maybe UPD. Which one? UPD. Oh, oh, oh you, 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 UPD. That's a U, UPD, that's a new protocol. Ah, <laughs> thank you. You're such a sassy one. I'm so glad I beat you last night in bowling. <laughs> Put you in your place. This is the kind of stuff I need you guys to tell me about when you catch it. See, I got it right here. Okay, so our protocol, there we go, is that better? Thank you. <laughs> um, then we've got our source. So this could be a combination of several things. You know, where is the request coming from? It can, of course, be IP addresses and network addresses. All the stuff we saw earlier in an address list could be in the source. But, of course, we could also just use an address list. So in this case, actually, Andy is in an address list. But I've also got a couple of additional source items in here as well. You can, so you can combine them together. Same thing with your destination. This can be a combination of ports, uh, port ranges. It also could be addresses, too. So, uh, for example, and I'll get your question here in a second. Let's say, this is not my virtual server. Let's say my virtual server is actually... 10.1.10.0.24. So it's a network address. It's a network virtual server. So I've now got one virtual server for 200 some odd possible back end uh, uh, requests. So now, if this was the case, I could actually make my destination rules include the destination IP. Only 10.1.10.50 and 10.1.10.60, whatever. Yes. Okay. Uh, my question is that uh, if we have a little like this and we specify the destination, and the destination IP is not the virtual server, the destination IP is the some, some IP behind it. It would be the destination IP. No, it would not. Because remember, this is this is AFM here. This is LTM. Oh. AFM is looking at what LTM has. We're looking at the virtual servers in question here. That's a perfect question. It's an excellent question when you might get a lot. Then we have our actions, accept, reject, drop. We've already talked about those. You'll see an additional action here, a little odd, accept decisively. We're going to talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Another fairly new feature that we added uh, I don't have a lot of great use cases for it because this is one of those features, quite honestly, that just so they appeared in the product and I didn't get a, I never saw any real explanation of why. I understand how to use it. I'm just not really sure if maybe a customer wanted this product or this feature. The idea here, though, is if somebody matches this rule, I could then just direct them to a different virtual server. Whoa. 
log data I want to generate. So not only do I only log to whatever virtual server has a logging profile, I will only log rules that have the logging enabled. So once I'm done with this, over on the uh, left side of the screen, we have the button to done editing. And another fairly new change we made with AFM, fairly new, it used to be that every time you completed a rule, you clicked on finished, it did what, what is called a compiling the rule. It compiled it within the AFM engine, very similar to applying changes in ASM. A lot of change, a lot of policy change. So every time you created a rule, it applied the changes, so to speak. Um, and sometimes administrators didn't want that. They want to be able to create two, five, ten rules at a time before it's all applied. <coughs> so that is the case now. So I could now do several things at once before I commit it. So just think of this as ASM's button that says apply policy change, or apply policy. And now I've got my rule done. So that's creating our first rule. Now I've got to do something with this policy. What am I going to do with this policy? What am I going to attach it to? Whoops. Yes, but that's not the only thing. I could also attach it to global. I could also attach it to wrong domain. You need to attach it to a context. You need to attach it to some context. Exactly. If I'm going to attach it to a virtual server, you do it in the exact same place that you would attach all of our other stuff, security related. Interesting note, if you go to a self IP screen just like this, you will see the self IP screen also has this security menu because this is where you would apply the policy to a self IP as well. So once I'm on this page, I've got my network firewall enforced and staging. The idea of staging, it's not quite the same as staging of ASM. No, no, I shouldn't say not quite the same. It is not the same as staging of ASM. What this means is put the firewall rules in place, but don't enforce them. Just let me see all the logging. I want to see what is being accepted and dropped and rejected, even though nobody's actually being dropped and rejected. So I can see what's going to be happening before it happens. I enforced the policy. I'm going to choose enforcement enabled, and I'll pick that new policy, and that's all it takes. Now we're good. Now we're done. So there's a couple of other tools we have to make this easier for our administrators. This is probably the main tool for firewall management ease for administrators. It's called the Active Rules page. This page is used to view all the firewall rules on this big IP. You can view them all, you can modify them, you can add new rules, you can delete rules, you can reorder rules. The idea is, and this is where a lot of changes were made with AFM in the last three or four years, is we used to have to go to multiple pages to manage rules. And firewall administrators don't like that. They want everything on one spot. So that's what we have now here on this page. By default, this page only displays the global context if there is a policy attached there. There may not even be a policy attached if you haven't yet created one. But I have, so I can see my policy with all the rules in place. And you'll notice one of my rules is using this interesting action called accept decisively. So let me explain what this means at this time. So let's say I have this rule here. I have this rule here that says SSH maintenance. So this says at the global level, any source can access port 22 on a schedule during work hours. And let's say that was set to accept and not accept decisively. Let's just say that. But then also I've got 10 virtual servers. And on one of my virtual servers, an administrator created a reject rule for port 22. The way that AFM works when we're checking hierarchy, looking for a rule match, is when I match a rule at the global context, 
I'm trying to do port 22 access on this virtual server. We go down, check the global context. Oh, look, I match this global rule of accept SSH maintenance. But <clears throat> AFM is going to say, you know what, I'm just going to go check and see if this request maybe matches something more specific at the self IP or the virtual server context level. And I get to the, to the virtual server and oh look, I do match a rule there that says to reject SSH access. So for that virtual server, I'm going to be rejected. All my other virtual servers I can access. Well, my big IP administrator finds out about this and says, wait a minute, that's not what I wanted. I wanted all administrators to be able to manage virtual servers with SSH. So they can change the action to accept decisively. This really only applies to global rules. And what it means is now, if I match a rule at the global context as accept decisively, I will be accepted, but no more rules are going to be looked at. And I would now be able to access that uh, virtual server on SSH. So that's accept decisively. Other stuff we see on this screen, we've got some rather interesting statistics for you, if you like. We can get probably much better statistics on our Splunk server, but, you know, there's some interesting stuff there. You'll also notice here at the bottom, there's this default line. This default line maps directly to this context, the global, we'll call this the global reject or drop context. I like that better, the global reject or drop context. This is what happens to any users. This is the rule that applies to any requests that don't match a rule in any other context. And you'll see presently, that's happened 401 times. Somebody's tried to request something that didn't match a rule in any context. Now, what if my administrator wants to work with the virtual server and the rules? We can do that. We're just going to select the item we want to manage here. We're going to manage a virtual server, and we're going to manage the Lorax virtual. In our previous version of this, the previous AFM version of this, uh, this was not a default. The default was that we just showed all rules on this page immediately. And I believe that the reason this was changed was because if an AFM uh, uh, deployment had 500 rules, imagine this page, so long. So this way we just sort of limit what we're working on at any one time. So now I still see my global context, but I'm going to scroll down to see my virtual server context. So what that means is your global context never goes away from the screen. You always see that. But I can now view my virtual server context. And you'll notice the virtual server context also has a default line. And this default line, the action, matches this action. So we were talking earlier and questioning why and how does AFM let traffic through to a virtual server if there are no rules created yet, but there actually was a rule created. As soon as we provision AFM, every virtual server, every self IP got its own default rule. And the action is whatever was configured here. So if this was changed to reject, or drop, the default rule for every virtual server and self IP would be reject or drop. So let's take a look here. I have, yes? This is the way you did it. So you mentioned that there's a default rule at the bottom. Right there, yeah. Yeah, which refers to whatever is defined in the global context. Nothing to do with the global context. 
directly to the global context. This is this is directly no, no, mass. Yes, the one at the bottom. To this. Yeah, no, I mean the one at the bottom. Oh, the one at the bottom is whatever is mapped to this. Right. So, so there's a D one at the bottom, and then there's a D one just above that. It's just above it for now, but this is all we see on the screen. So. Imagine this, if you can see this, I'll try to make this nice and big. I'm not used to such small whiteboards. So, if I was expanding this out and I, I could actually see everything, I might have global at the top, then I have VIP1, VIP2, VIP3, self IP1. Default bottom, and then each one of these has a default. Default, so forth. So when I'm looking to see a match, if my request matches the IP of this virtual server, this is going to be the rule that I might match. I'll never make it down here. But if I don't match a rule here, I'm not matching that one, I'm not matching that one, or that one, or that one, that's going to be the rule I eventually match. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, it does. So there's a default per context. Per context. And then there's an overall default. Correct. Huh? But these cannot be changed independent of each other. They all have the exact same setting, whatever this is. And similarly, the, okay, so that's just one. So and this just has whatever this is. So with that in mind, here's my question. What if, so right now, I have a rule that says accept traffic from all of these sources on all of these ports, and inside of this is port 80, 443, we'll say that. Somebody from the U.S. right now tries to request that virtual server on Telnet, port 23. Oh, I'm sorry, not tell that. Well, let's say it is tell that. Let's tell that. Well, great. They're going to match this rule. They're coming from the U.S. They got matching port 23. Fantastic. Somebody else tries to request that virtual server on port 3389 for RDP access. What is their effective action going to be? Will they be accepted, rejected, or dropped? If somebody from the U.S. is trying to access my Lorax virtual on port 3389, will they be accepted, rejected, or dropped? Make the, let's make it easier. What rule will they match? Which default rule? Which one? You mean this one down here? That was they're going to match this one. They're going to match the default rule for that virtual because they're accessing that virtual. So they're not going to match this rule. So they'll go to the next one and match this rule. That's not what I wanted. I don't want people to access port 3389 or any other ports. So my question is this. I don't want to change. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to change the global setting of this. I don't want to change that to reject. That's going to be too much management on a big IP. So how can I ensure that any requests that don't match this rule get rejected and not accepted? Easy answer. I'm sorry? A little louder in my ears. How can I ensure that any requests that don't match this rule for this virtual are going to be rejected. Nothing to do with the global context. I just need to create a rule. We just need a second rule. That's all. We just need another rule. Because that's what my next page is. is uh, oh, first off, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Jumped ahead, so I'll go back to that thought. But we can also use this page to edit rules. So I'm going to edit my uh, my uh, HV rule. I'm adding Canada. I'm adding a new port, 8080. Still have to click on done editing, and we still have to cl click on commit changes to the system. So now we'll talk to now that we 
that being said, now this is where my point of my discussion, you're supposed to ask that question. What happens if they request 3389? They will be accepted, they're gonna match this rule. What do I do about it? I have to create another rule. So of course we can use this page to create a rule as well. That's what we're gonna use this little dropdown for. And you'll see right now it says, add rule to global, add rule to virtual, you're only going to see add rule to virtual if you're viewing a virtual context. If you're not, you're not going to see add rule to virtual. So I'll choose that. It places the rule at the top. I'll just fill in what I want, which is pretty basic. Reject all of the name of the rule. Any requests, any source, any destination, and reject. Nothing fancy, nothing special. I'll also enable logging so I can see every time that happens. So now there's my new rule. So now I know every time somebody accesses 3389, oh, they're gonna match that rule, they'll be rejected. So now what happens when somebody tries to access port 80? They're gonna be rejected. Yeah, I'm gonna match that rule first. So we have to do some reordering here as well. So we can reorder rules very easily. I need to reorder this, get to that in a second. Very easy to do. Literally a click and drag. Drag it down to here, and then you're done. You still have to commit changes. Yes. Question? The question is that if we have uh, rule one that is stating whatever things to accept, then what's the point of having rule one when everything is allowed at the bottom is already accept? You know what I mean? Because it's a default rule accept. So I do not need any more rule at the top to accept anymore. Uh, that's not necessarily true because, um, I mean, okay, I, I got what you're asking. You don't know, you don't know what this Lorex virtual is. This Lorex virtual may be an open virtual, uh, no ports assigned. So I want to make sure that it's only accepted for these ports. So I, if I. If, I, if, if all I had was 10.1.10.20 colon port 80, and I didn't care who requested it, I didn't care where it came from, what country, anywhere, you're right, I wouldn't need any rules at all. I could just 